Why Princeton? Um, <laughs> so the thing that I love the most about it is like just jumping around between different things and, you know, enjoying the flexibility that the, the school gives. So I'm not sure like if, you know, music is the right thing for me to do or acting or English or history, um, which are all things that are like connected, but obviously you need to take different classes for them. <laughs> you know, you have to choose which major you want to do and all that. But Princeton is probably the best place, at least for me, where all of those different areas are like very strongly taught and you're given the freedom and, and you're actually encouraged to, you know, not sort of make up your mind until you've done all these distribution requirements and sort of, you know, dip your toes in each of the different departments. I'm probably going to switch my major a few times um, before I, you know, settle on it. So, you know, what better place than um, a school that really does not force you to choose when you're applying. I grew up in a small town and I never imagined myself ever going to an Ivy League school. I don't think anyone from my high school had ever gone to Princeton. And so when I found out I got in and after coming to Accepted Students Day, I really thought, wow, this is this is where I belong. I really felt a sense of belonging. I was kind of surprised by the diversity of people and attitudes and walks of life that people come from, because I feel like it's easy to have an image in your head of what Princeton students are like, but I think there are so many diverse and interesting people here that any expectation I had disappeared. When I thought about the Ivy League education, you think of such a high price tag, but they're so accommodating to people from different income levels. And so I think that really made it possible for me to be able to go here, which is awesome. As an engineer, Princeton's liberal arts education allows me to go out of my comfort zone and meet new people that are not just engineers or concentrators in STEM. One of my best friends is an African-American studies concentrator. And while we may not have a lot in common academically, we were able to learn more from each other since we have different passions and love talking about them. Uh, Princeton prides itself on its communities and it creates, and I think that shows not only in our undergraduate time here, but also after we leave the orange bubble. Our alumni network is incredible and every single alum that I've connected with is always happy and willing to help another tagger out. And Princeton continues to provide resources even after you graduate. And I could not be more grateful that I get to call this place home for four years. So as a high school senior, I was unsure of a lot of things. College feels like the beginning of the rest of your life, which is super intimidating. But I felt that at Princeton, I would be supported in whatever I chose to do. Whether it's my amazing professors who truly care about me and what's going on in my life, even beyond academics, to the encouraging staff in the office of the Dean of Undergraduate Students, who are always there to guide me, or my remarkable friends who are most definitely the best people in the world. The people and the sense of community that I found at Princeton, both going in and that I've developed throughout my four years here, have really changed my life. I wanted a place where I felt like I belonged and was surrounded by people who wanted me there. When you're looking at colleges, like especially pay attention to on the tours, like not just how your tour guides are interacting and like, do you vibe with your tour guide? But like, look at the people around the campus. See, like, are they heads down, like sad going to their classes? Or are they like stopping to say hi to people on the way? Is your tour guide getting high fived by people as they walk along? It's, it's pretty rare that you see the kind of close community that you'll find at Princeton. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Meet Princeton, a podcast to introduce prospective students and their families to Princeton University, brought to you from the Office of Admission at Princeton. My name is Vivian Slee, and I'm a Senior Assistant Dean in the Office of Admission, and I'm so happy that you've tuned in to join us to hear from current student voices and others about our community and about what it's like to be a student at Princeton just now. So as 2020 winds down, we bring you a special edition of Meet Princeton. My friend and co-host Bryant Blunt, Assistant Dean and Manager of Strategic Communications in the Office of the Dean of Undergraduate Students will join me in a little bit to catch up on some very exciting university news related, in fact, to Meet Princeton Episode 2. So what happened in Episode 2, you may ask yourself? Well, you can always go back and listen if you haven't already. So you'll just have to stay tuned to hear more about that news. In the meantime, 
For this special edition, we're going to drop into a conversation between Dean of Admission Karen Richardson and Director of Admission Matt Alander, where they discuss everything from admissions to new campus buildings to why they both came to work at Princeton. So let's listen. Good morning, Karen. Happy Thursday. Happy Thursday. It's been a long week. It has, but it's always nice to, to see you at least virtually on, on screen. So I, we're going to have a, a bit of a conversation, I think, about just college admissions and, and Princeton and where we are in the, in the cycle and just a kind of a casual conversation. I like it. I like it. Yeah. You and I can talk so, about college admission in general just because we spent so much time working together at another yeah. university and then working here together has been great. Yeah, agreed, agreed. So maybe we'll start with, why don't you just give us a brief introduction? Who are we talking to today? <laughs> so, sure. So I'm um, Karen Richardson, and I am Dean of Admission at Princeton. I uh, was appointed to this job in July of 2019. Uh, I'm a proud alum of the university as well. I graduated in 1993. I can't believe it's been that long. Oh, my gosh. It hasn't um, been that long. It's been a while. It's been a while. And things have changed a lot here. While the university is one that is, you know, steeped in a lot of tradition, a lot has changed in the past several years and a lot of very positive things, I think. I'm among the first generation in my family to attend college. I do have three older siblings, all of whom went to college. And I um, was lucky that my brother, Bob, who is six years older than me, actually uh, applied to Princeton and went here. And so I knew a little bit about the university having come to visit him. Um, I have to admit, I looked at other places, um, but at the end of the day when I applied and was admitted, I, I knew what a, a, an interesting place and, and the types of opportunities that, that Princeton could give me. And so I decided to come here and I've, I've never regretted that decision, which is, is fun. I've worked in college admission the past 13, 14 years or so. Most of that is, was at Tufts University. And I started there as a director of diversity recruitment. And then I directed graduate admission for a bit. And then I was dean of admission for the the last three years that I was there. But it's been nice to be back home at a place that means so much to me and a place that really shaped who I am, how I think about things. Um, And it's just so much fun to be back here and working with people that I really enjoy, doing a work that I love and um, helping to shape future classes for Princeton for my alma mater. It's It's a homecoming. It is a homecoming. It is a homecoming. Yeah. I, you know, it's funny. I never, if somebody had asked me, I don't know that I would have said that I would be moving back to New Jersey because <laughs> I grew up here <laughs> uh, and spent 20 plus years in Boston. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's been nice. It's been, it's been good to be back. Yeah. Well, so, you know, you've worked in admissions for, for quite, quite a few years. Um, but I, I imagine this year has been uh, and still is unlike any other that that you've experienced. So obviously the pandemic has changed everyone's life uh, in some ways. Um, obviously it's changed our work, um, you know, how we do our work, but also changed college admissions for, for high school students and for, for counselors and for, for teachers. So kind of what are some of your takeaways from this year for this cycle? Kind of how has college admissions changed due to, to COVID? Um, and what are some of the things that you're thinking about as we go through this, this year's cycle? Well, the first thing I would say is that it's the world has changed for everyone, right? And so in in the sense that we're all in this together, it's not about, you know, that the world has changed for high schools, but not for colleges or for some people and not for others. I mean, we all can recognize the fact that things are just different. And when we're evaluating applications, we are going to have that in mind. We recognize that um, everything, you know, was pretty much thrown into upheaval in March. For me, it's interesting, you know, 
I have not seen my entire team or we haven't seen our team in months Mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. Um, There are people that we hired over the summer that I've never actually met in person, (laughs) only over Mm -hmm. Zoom. So Mm -hmm. that's very different. But when it comes to uh, college admission, I think it's, you know, we've always tried to be flexible as we, as we Mm -hmm. read in our holistic way, as we look at, every aspect of what a student sends to us as part of an application, but this year is even more so. It's even more pronounced that we recognize that the spring, you know, schools shut down very suddenly and often schools weren't able to provide grades to students or not every student had the same access to online education as other students did. And that has continued into the fall. And so we we definitely are are taking that into consideration. We also recognize that testing agencies, the College Board, the ACT, there has been real stress um, on the part of students not being able to take those tests. So we did move to a test optional process this year, which many of our peers did as well. Um, So that's, you know, that's very different. Um, We also recognize that it was going, the the fall was going to still be um, a bit of a challenge for many students. So we did decide to pause our early action process this year so that we could give students and their teachers and their counselors who are writing the recommendation letters for them as much time as possible to create the best applications. And it also helped us to um, be able to look at our entire pool at one time. And that just felt fair. That felt like it was more fair to students across the board um, to be able to to look at everything at, at once. So, you know, I think that Yes, times have changed, but I think that um, one of the takeaways I hope that people will have is that we recognize that and we, um, as I often say, context is an admission counselor's best friend. So we are trying to take it all into consideration um, as we evaluate applications. Yeah, that's a great point. And I think that's sometimes easy to I can imagine it's easy to forget, especially as a high school student, right, where you're sending off an application to this office where you don't know who works there necessarily or who's reading your application. And we're all real people who, you know, have experienced uh, this pandemic as well and, and come from a place of understanding and um, and, and wanting to be to, to be flexible. And, and I think that's an important takeaway as, as well. Well, that's what I always say, right? The human, it's, it's a human process. The yeah. admission process is a human process. There, there are humans on the other side once you press submit on your application. And we're people who have lives outside of the work that we do. Mm-hmm. And yes, this pandemic has affected all of us. So we can talk a little bit about the application itself. So we at Princeton use the common application or the coalition application, but we also have a Princeton supplement and where we ask students to give us a little bit more information about who they are, what they're excited about, what they're passionate about. So maybe if you want to just talk us through a little bit about the the Princeton supplement, and I think also maybe talk a little bit about some of the changes that we made to the supplement this year, because it does look a little bit different in terms of what questions we're asking uh, students and and what we're asking them to to talk about. It does. And I would say, you know, broadly, a a college supplement is is an important piece of an application because it is more specific to the college or the university that a student is applying to. And so my belief is that the supplement should really reflect the things that are important to a college or a university. And so we did make some changes to our supplement this year. We were we took a step back and, and wanted to think about what is it that we hope to learn from students as part of an application. You know, we have their transcript in, you know, any other year we would have test scores. And that that gives us sort of the quantitative pieces to determine could a student be academically successful here? And 
for the most case, the answer is yes. Um, but we also are building a community and we're trying to bring together students who are really going to engage one another in the classroom and in the common room and on the field and in the choir. And we want to get to know how students think about things. And that's part of why the supplement is useful. We changed our questions to ask about civic engagement because that's an important part of a Princeton education. Um, and we also asked about an opportunity for students to talk about a time when they might have had a difficult conversation or had to engage in a difficult situation and how they, how they learned from it. What did they learn from that? Because one of the things that makes Princeton a dynamic place is that we have a community of learners who come from so many different backgrounds and experiences. And our hope is that people can come here and have respectful conversations with people who don't think exactly like they do. So we wanted to learn a little bit about how has the student started to engage in those types of conversations now. We've also asked students to write um, about 250 words or so on what piques their curiosity right now academically, whether they're interested in an engineering degree or a Bachelor of Arts degree. And again, we're not asking students to be completely wedded to a particular discipline when they come in, but it's just good to, to get an idea of what it is that, that students are thinking about. So, and then we have some fun questions on the supplement as well about what a student hopes to, to gain, uh, what sort of skill they hope to gain. And my personal favorite is, you know, what's the pers- what's the soundtrack of your life right now? Do you have an answer to that, Matt? I don't know. Uh, you, know soundtrack? you know, as I I do like to have music on in the background as I'm working. Yeah. I've been listening to the Broadway playlist on Spotify, so I guess that would be my answer at the at the moment. So okay. yes, what about yours? Good question. The funny thing is, I'm I'm laughing because I fear that when I start reading more applications i'm not going to recognize any of the artists or the songs because i'm old (laughs) it'll make you feel Um, old i I don't disagree with that i feel the same way (laughs) but it's okay it's okay i don't i i yeah i listen to broadway stuff too but okay all right well if anything i'm going to keep a list of of some of these answers so i can explore new music and and books and and whatnot so i i like that yeah, yeah. I, and all I have to say is I'm excited to, I think our questions are, are great this year. And I think we're going to learn a lot about our applicants that we always have, but I'm excited to, to really start reading, uh, reading files this, this winter. Same here. Same here. So. I, I always learn something and um, I've been doing this long enough that I feel like I learn something new every year yeah. or mm-hmm. I find a reference to something that I think, I want to learn a little bit more about that. And so Mm -hmm. I I go to the internets and I figure it out. (laughs) (laughs) It's always helpful. (laughs) I like it. Um, So let's talk about Princeton itself um, as a, as a place. What did you study while you were an undergrad? And then continuing on, maybe how has Princeton changed from when you were a student here to, to now? And again, that's, I know, an open end or kind of a a broad question, but however you want to interpret that. So, you know, the first thing I would say is that I think the beauty of a Princeton education is that you have the opportunity to explore before you really become focused on something. And, you know, so it's a liberal arts education where you are borrowing from a lot of different disciplines and learning how to think about things from a lot of different perspectives. So I think back to my my first year here and um, working with my advisor, thinking about what types of classes I should take. And I was, again, I went to a tiny public high school in New Jersey where I didn't have access to a lot of different types of classes. And so I think I wanted to um, stick to some of what I knew. So I think I took a calculus class and I took a French class. But then I also was able to branch out a little bit and take a class. I think I took a politics class and I, and I took a history class, the history of women in science, um, which was 
uh, just a very interesting class. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, moving forward in my undergraduate career, I was able to take classes in art. And, you know, one class that was completely studying medieval art in Europe, it was called. And, and we did a lot of work looking at cathedrals. And um, our class trip was into New York to go to the cloisters. And uh, it was fascinating, not something that I had ever imagined. And it had nothing to do with my eventual politics major, but it was something that was interesting and it helped me to stretch my mind a bit and just was important to academic growth uh, as I moved forward. Um, of course, I think people know that one of the hallmarks of a Princeton education is the senior thesis. So we want students to move from being consumers of knowledge to being real producers of, of knowledge and uh, working on independent research and working closely with a member of the faculty who is just, you know, a, a leader in their field. And so um, by my senior year, of course, I had to figure out my, my senior thesis topic and uh, work with my advisor, who uh, at the time was teaching constitutional interpretation here. It was not always an, an easy road, <laughs> honestly, mm -hmm. um, being <laughs> here as a student. But again, it's it stretched stretched my mind the opportunity yeah. to be here and to be in class with students who just thought differently from me, and mm -hmm. to be able to engage in conversations with them. How has this place changed in the past <laughs> three decades? Um, you don't have to tell us exactly how long it's been. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, well, I did class in 93. So oh, good point, good point. Out. I think some of the important things have, have stayed the same. I think that it's, mm -hmm. it's still a place where that is very committed to undergraduates and to undergraduate education. The fact that um, just over 5,000 undergrads and under 3,000 graduate students, the faculty is really here because they enjoy engaging with undergraduate students, whether it's through junior independent work or the senior thesis or teaching and office hours or being advisors. It's a real commitment to undergraduate education. Also, the resources that, that Princeton has to not only support students, but to, to allow them to, to stretch and to think beyond what they think that they could do um, is amazing. I think one of the things that's really changed since I was here is that there's even more commitment to studying abroad. Very few students studied abroad when I was here. I think oh, that people, interesting. Yeah, I think that people really just, they were so excited to be here on campus. Here, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But now that we have our, our Novogratz Bridge year, where students work abroad before they even begin their Princeton career, and the fact that a number of our students do study abroad during their four years here is something that's very different. Mm. I think there's even more um, support for students, not just academically, but um, whether it's mental health availability, that is, that is something that I think has definitely grown over the past several years. I also think that just through the, the Office of the Dean of Students, there is so much more activity for, for students, um, for student groups and uh, university-sponsored activities. And even the Campus Center is different. We did have a Campus Center, but it was much smaller than, than yeah. the Frist Campus Center that exists now. And so I think that Frist really does serve as an opportunity for students to come together on campus um, yeah. outside of the classroom. Well, and going off of that, I think one thing that definitely has changed is the the physical spaces on Absolutely. campus. And <laughs> just in terms of new buildings, I mean, even in the time that I've been here, uh, seeing the construction that has been going on, which is, in my mind, really exciting because uh, it shows the commitment to, to the facilities moving forward. But one of the, the major construction projects is uh, the two new residential colleges that, that Princeton is, is building. And, and that, in turn, means uh, a larger class size. And so I don't know if you wanted to talk a little bit about what that means and what that might mean for, for admissions in years ahead. And Matt, I have to say, um, somehow the hills have gotten bigger too. It takes me longer. Of course they have. <laughs> I feel more out of breath. I'm not sure why. 
<laughs> um, so yes, the it is exciting. There's there's a lot of um, movement, a lot of new construction that's happening on campus right now, including the the art museum that's undergoing mm. a, a huge mm-hmm. renovation and the building of the two new residential colleges. So yes, I mean it's exciting because our president has often said that um, we would love to be able to provide a Princeton education to more students. And the ability to be able to do that, the fact that we have such generous alumni who are giving money to be able to make this happen is exciting. So we'll be <laughs> expanding, uh, slowly expanding the, the size of the student body within the enrolling class. And it doesn't mean that we're going to be looking for anything different than we have before. It's just that we'll be able to include more students as, as part of this. So it is exciting for us. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So I I think we're almost out of time. I don't know if that's actually true. Can I ask you a question? You may certainly ask me a question, Karen. So for me, it was a homecoming, right? It was coming back home, not only to New Jersey, but also to my alma mater. And so why did you decide to come in and work at Princeton? Great question. So a little bit of a backstory. So I've been here about 18 months, I would say. And um, I worked at my alma mater for uh, about 10 years. So, um, you know, total spent almost 15 years at, at one institution. And so it was it was very hard to, to leave. Um, and I was only looking for opportunities that I could connect with and kind of see myself being able to advocate for the, the mission and the, and the values. And I think Princeton very much is one of those places. Echoing a lot of what you said, um, I, I really value the commitment to to undergraduates and the undergraduate experience just because um, of the experience that I had in college and how important that was for my own growth, both academically and, and personally. As I was doing research about Princeton, as I was you know, going through a, a job search, not necessarily a college search, again, just being really impressed with all of the various aspects of the Princeton experience, again, from the size to the financial aid uh, and, and resources that we have for, for students here to the, the students that make up the Princeton community. Again, I think they're students who are really dedicated to whatever their academic focus is, but not limited to, uh, to just that. You know, they're able to explore other areas and participate in activities outside of whatever their their main academic discipline might be. Um, so it feels like a exciting place and fun place to, to be. Um, and so I think those were some of the reasons that stood out to me as I decided to, to work here. Great. Well, we're thrilled that you're here. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe I'll end with, Karen, if you want to tell us one of your favorite memories from your time here as an undergrad. I might have a couple. I'll, I'll just I'll fair, tell that's them. Fair. <laughs> so, you know, as I think about this time of year as we're heading into the holiday season, when students are on campus, there was always a holiday arch sing where all of the acapella groups would come together mm-hmm. and sing a number of different carols and a couple of my friends were in uh in acapella groups so you know it's just this gorgeous scene in Blair Arch at um which is the largest arch on campus and it's snowing and you know it's like 10 o'clock at night and it's cold out and everybody's bundled up and uh drinking hot chocolate and and you know it's just it was such a, a sense of community and just a fun time to be with friends. I also think back to Blair Arch during a commencement week. So when you're a senior leading up to commencement day, there's class day and there's a senior prom. And there's also- oh, I a like senior, that. Yeah, it's kind of fun <laughs> where you can bring your family. Yeah. Um, but there's a senior arch thing one evening as well. So all of the seniors come together wearing their senior jackets that um, we have designed as a class. And we just, you sing songs that have meant something to the class over the four years. So, you know, Brown Eyed Girl was one of ours, which definitely shows my age, but, um, but I just remember being out there and it's sort of this culmination of four years of being with these people who at one time were strangers to you um, mm-hmm. when you arrived on campus your first year. And it's this just 
culmination of community and the class. And um, I'm, I'm happy to say that some of my closest friends in life are people who I met when I was here at Princeton and we still mm-hmm. keep in close touch. And sometimes it feels like no time has passed at all, which is great. Yeah. So. Well, I think that is a great way to end this conversation. And I'm, I'm hopeful that in future years, I'll be able to experience that because I do love college acapella. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> Well, maybe we could sing our way out of this interview. I, think, uh, I don't know if, I don't know if you want to hear that, unfortunately. But uh, well, thank you, Karen. I appreciate thank you. it. Thanks. Hi, Bryant. How's it going? Good, Vivian. How are you? I'm fine. So we just heard a great conversation between Karen Richardson, our dean, and Matt Alander our director of admissions, and they talked about a lot of different things. Karen's experience at Princeton as an alum, the classes she took, her favorite uh, events on campus, things like that. And they also talked a bit about like the diverse fields of study that are available to students on campus. And I know that there was big news recently, and it's related to a previous podcast episode with Gab Duguay. So I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about that. Yes, it's, it's interesting. Um, Karen talked about the campus changing in a lot of ways. I think physically, right, was one big one, the buildings you see going up. But, you know, another thing is Princeton evolves with the times and the and the courses of study and intellectual growth and development. And, and like you said, there's a great announcement that Eric Schmidt and his wife, Wendy, endowed a new professorship of Indigenous Studies. So as you said, Gab, who was a concentrator who was working in these types of areas, well, now the, the efforts of those students and faculty and alumni, obviously, have come together to, to help us continue to build those new diverse areas of study. That is very, very exciting. There was another trustee, Peter Wendell, from the class of 72, and his wife, Lynn Wendell, whose class of 77, also established a new fund, a permanent fund to support research and teaching and programming support for enrolled students related to Indigenous groups. So that's, I thought that was great. Yeah, I mean, Princeton, to some people, especially when you're here as a student for four years, it doesn't seem like a lot changes. But I mean, ask anybody who's graduated uh, not even that long ago, right? I think Dean Richardson is is pretty recent, I would say, in a lot of cases. And yeah. and she's yeah. saying that Princeton has changed so, so much. And that's in, in, in inspiring ways, I think. So I'm very glad to have, to, to have seen that happen. That's great. I think it's really interesting what Karen and Matt were speaking about in terms of the admission process being a human process that, you know, there are people on the other side of it. And I think that it's it's very easy as a prospective student or family member of a prospective student to think that this is a process that is sort of not very human. And I understand that because you're filling out these applications, you may not have that much of a touchstone to a university that you're applying to. But I'm really delighted that they talked about that because I think it's so important for our listeners to know that overall, the community of the university is a very human place as well. So let's see, any other things that you think we should touch on from their discussion? Only if you want to tell us why you enjoy working at Princeton. Why do I enjoy working at Princeton? Oh, gosh. You know what? I have to say, I really love I know this sounds corny, and we talk about community all the time, but I really do love being a part of the university community and the town community. I was actually born in Princeton. I grew up in Trenton. I never had much of a connection to the town until we moved here many years ago and brought our kids up here and so on. And now working there, it just, I don't know, the sense of belonging and sense of creating a place for yourself and of the really, I have to say, really diverse community because it was a different place. Let's just say that when I was growing up, I grew up in a Latino community in in Trenton. Uh, My mother's from Colombia. And so, you know, I grew up speaking Spanish and English and coming to Princeton was, it was, it was a different place then. For me, it's, it's very personally gratifying and I really enjoy being a part of this community and seeing how it's changed all for the better. Why do you enjoy working here? Well, I actually had a, I sort of was um, speaking to a group of coaches and students this weekend and explaining to them what I do at the university and as I do to so many people and how um, this aspect of student life. Sorry, my cat's meowing. Wants to contribute to the conversation. Um, wake up. 
Yeah, she's, she's uh, saying, Brian, don't forget away. to say this. Yes. Can you hear, can you hear this? So um, as I was sort of saying to a group of, of coaches and just sort of explaining my role and introducing myself, um, was that, uh, you know, I'm a Princeton alum and I was a student athlete and I had a, uh, an experience at Princeton where I was able to blend, as we talk so much about in this podcast, my academic interests with extracurricular interests and the liberal arts education overall, sort of being an opportunity to, to really sort of um, incorporate all these different aspects into the development of an entire person. It's a lot of fancy speak, but at the end of the day, you know, I'm from southeastern Pennsylvania and going to Princeton changed my life in a lot of ways, opened the world to me in a lot of ways and was a really meaningful experience. This has been great. And I think that we are not going to meet again until, you know, with our listeners, that is, until the new year, until 2021. We have a few podcasts lined up for 2021. And so we'll be uh, meeting with other students to talk to them. They'll be sharing their experiences at Princeton and look forward to meeting those students and to having our listeners meet them and to moving forward with this podcast and seeing how it evolves. Uh, it's been very exciting to be working with you this year to do this together. Indeed. Thank you. Thank you for uh, allowing me to, to help with this project. And Absolutely. Happy holidays to, to you and yours and to everyone out there. We hope you enjoyed listening to this episode of Meet Princeton. As I said earlier, this podcast was created with prospective students and their families in mind. And so with that, I'd like to direct all of our listeners to our admission website at admission.princeton.edu. There you can watch, read, engage virtually, and learn more about Princeton University. The mailbag will return in our next episode, so for all of the prospective students who are out there listening and have burning questions about admissions, and I'm sure that many of you actually have similar questions, and if you'd like to hear those questions read and responded to live on air, please submit them to the mailbag section of the Meet Princeton webpage on our admission website. Meet Princeton's audio engineers, Nick Dinoli of Orange Box Pictures, Mary Buckley and I, Vivian Slee, our executive producers. Bryant Blunt is our co-host and consultant, and Veronica Salazar is our editorial consultant. Original music was composed by Molly Truman, who is also our sound designer and engineer from the class of 2024. We'd also like to thank the wonderful students who contributed to our intro for this episode in answering the question, why Princeton? A big thank you goes out to Christina Hain, Rachel Hazan, Ian Aceta, Janielle Dumapit, Haley Mitchell, and Gaia Lawton. And a big, big thank you, especially to our listeners, for tuning in. We'll be leaving you now with a recording from the Princeton University Chapel Choir. The choir is an auditioned choral ensemble made up of undergraduate and graduate students, some staff, and a few community members. And this excerpt is from the composer Gustav Holst entitled, Oh God Beyond All Praising, which is a piece sung at opening exercises every year, and also features Eric Plutz, the university organist. Thank you so much again for listening. We wish you all a very happy holiday season, and we hope you'll join us next time on Meet Princeton. <laughs>